Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining our panel. We are honored to have with us four distinguished panelists. They are among those who have gone beyond the call of duty to assist our faculty with the difficult transition from face-to-face -to, -face to alternative teaching modalities. So it's only fitting that we ask them to discuss the challenges and maybe the opportunities that confront our teaching in the months ahead. Our panel runs for 30 minutes, after which we will open up the floor to questions from the audience for about 15 minutes or so. Before we start our discussion, let me take a minute to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Dr. Bibiana Diaz is an associate professor of Spanish in the Department of World Languages and Literature. She also teaches in the Summer Language School at Middlebury College. She serves as a member of the editorial board for the theater journal Hestos, Revista de Teoría y Práctica de Teatro Hispánico. She is the CSUSB Affordable Learning Solutions Coordinator, and as you know, in that role, she helped faculty save over $1 million and a half in instructional materials costs. She is the director of the Student Theatre Group in Spanish, Acto Latino, a group which has graced the stages of various universities and theatre festivals in San Bernardino, Cal Poly Pomona, Long Beach, San Diego, and North Carolina, Bogota, and Cuba. Our second panelist, Dr. Sharon Kalkowski, teaches in the College of Education and serves as a secondary level administration in the Desert Sands Unified School District. She has extensive experience in teaching in blended and online modalities at both high school and higher education level in the education department and as a field work supervisor of student teachers and aspiring administrators. Dr. Oraib Mango, our third panelist, is a professor of Arabic language, literature, and culture in the Department of World Languages and Literatures. She has an all-encompassing experience in distance education, especially hybrid and online teaching, and she's also a voice thread certified educator. Her research focuses on bilingual education, sociolinguistics, with particular focus on the intersection of language, power, and identity and innovative uses of technology in language learning. Last but not least, Dr. Craig Seal is a professor of management in the Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration. Before pursuing a career in academia, he was a manager and executive with experience in nonprofit, real estate, and staffing industries. Dr. Seal has served as the Dean and Associate Vice President for Undergraduate Studies the Associate Dean of the College of Business, as well as the MBA Accreditation and Student Service uh, Director roles. His research agenda is on personal interpersonal capacity development and the scholarship of teaching and learning. His teaching philosophy is to integrate management theory and student written instructor facilitated cases. So without further ado, let us um, start our discussion with the panelists. So, um, as we all know, seemingly overnight, we had to convert our face-to-face -face courses into remote instruction. And I'm curious, in your opinion, what distinguishes remote instruction from online teaching? I think one of the things, um, and, and Dr. Monty Van Wart hinted at this, is normally, in normal times, um, one of the big distinguishing feature between online and face-to-face -face is planning. Um, as a faculty member, um, I found I could be um, a little bit more impulsive um, and intuitive in working with the class and kind of trying to meet the class where they are in a face-to-face -face situation, but I found that it's much better when possible to have planned out in as much detail um, and to really link back the course objectives to the assignment to the information you're providing um, in an online environment. Would anybody else want to comment? Hi, it's Sharon. Um, yes, I'd like to go ahead and uh, discuss part of the differences between the remote instruction is sort of denoting that you're providing the materials, whereas the actual online teaching is the dissemination of the materials and there's a nuance with that with the online teaching that requires some carefully prepared modules lessons examinations of the 
targets of learning for the students and what objectives and how those can be fit into an eight to 10 week sequence. Because we've been thrust into more of this emergency remote instruction, it's required people to refine very quickly what it is that they need to um, exact for the students. They have to have those essential standards, the essential questions, at the same time, keeping it simple enough to honor the fact that not everybody is on the same page with the technology usage. So there's a, there's a nuance between the two. One is more instructional, it's providing the content, the actual teaching is digging into the toolbox, looking at what works best for that particular instructor who may or may not have um, a wealth of background in technology and usage and platforms and so on and ways in which to bridge that gap for the students in the most expedient circumstances. To go back to what Dr. Van Wert said is something that we have to understand here is to be forgiving of ourselves, to be forgiving of each other, um, but at the same time to have those high expectations and to know that this is an opportunity for the staff, also for the students, to be very clear in communication and expectations and to honor that with fidelity um, throughout the course. Thank you, Dr. Kalkowski. I wonder if the other two panelists, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Mango, would like to add something? I think everything has said so far, but yes, I think the big difference is, um, as they uh, pointed, is like uh, in the online teaching, you will have more elaborate design, you will have like a more robust and rich, um, educational ecosystem, you will have months of preparations and design and organizing of the activities, while the emergency teaching is more like a provider temporary access to instruction and just make sure that everything is going to be available during this emergency time and the material is going to be accessible for the students. That's like the main difference. And the faculty, they need to know that they cannot become uh, like an expert on online teaching in the two weeks break that we have. And that's a very important thing, like uh, right now, it's like an emergency teaching, trying to deliver the contact and making more, um, you know, the material available for the students versus the online teacher where it takes months of preparations to prepare your class. Thank you. Um, clearly, the situation presents many stressful challenges for faculty who have had little time to prepare and convert their courses. So what could be some simple but effective strategies that faculty could implement in their classes which would make a difference in their student learning? Dr. Mango, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would. I think the best strategy right now is just to simplify and uh, just focus on student learning outcomes for the course. Like my colleagues have, have said before, it's very important to um, think about what is our essential learning? What is our essential question? What, is re what does really matter? What really matters for us right now and for our students in terms of learning, but also in terms of well-being? Um, I think once we put, uh, give the students the learning outcomes, we have to be very explicit and sharing them with them and showing them how they are driving the learning. So in every experience that we do that we are planning online, uh, we are including tasks and activities that are explicit in showing students how they connect to the student learning outcomes. So it becomes very meaningful to them and they don't think about it as um, um, just um, busy work. One of the things I think it's really important given this unprecedented time and this dramatic shift um, from face to face to online for most of our faculty is to talk to your students. Um, you know, simple surveys, um, discussion boards, questions, but ask them. Um, we make a lot of assumptions about technology, bandwidth, assignments, uh, cheating has been a big one. Um, you know, this is an opportunity to engage your students on the course. What are the deliverables? What's the content? What's the best way to meet those? And so I think more than ever, having open and frank dialogue with your students about this new modality and what things that we can do um, to help them and to help ourselves um, is going to be really critical, particularly for the spring term. Yes, I, I think I would like to emphasize 
clear communications and Hela is very important. If you have a clear communication with your students, I think it's a, a very the key of uh, the key of success in your classroom. Mm, probably the faculty now is kind of like overwhelmed with all this technology. Or we had these apps and several um, applications that they can use, but just keep a simple, clear uh, communication. You can do that through the Blackboard announcements. Uh, even you know, in the Blackboard announcement, the difference is even if they get the email of what you have said to the student, you will keep the information in the Blackboard site, so the students can also go back and and check the information. Another important thing is provide feedback. The students is for them is very important because right now they are not many of the professors are doing a synchronous teaching, which one is great, but some of them has chose to do an asynchronous um, teaching uh, methodology. So the feedback uh, to the students, I think it's very crucial during this time, especially because it's not only stressful for the faculty, but for the student as well. So, and another key point is, as Orai says, uh, keep clear all our goals and uh, all outcomes from the classroom, but also be uh, flexible with the deadlines and the assignments, you know, because many of the students is the first time they are handling online teaching and online learning environment. Um, to echo the sentiments of all of my colleagues, absolutely the communication is key. I think the interesting thing here is that with many of our younger students and even the adult learners, that they like to communicate via text, via typewritten, and sometimes people come out of their shells a little bit more in this capacity. So it's a good opportunity, whereas sometimes sitting in the classroom, they can have more of sitting in the back and be shy. So this is a really good opportunity for that clear and effective communication um, to really get at the depth of understanding using discussion board with fidelity providing a very clear simple rubric for the students discussion board very often it provides that window into the conversation and the understanding that the students are engaging in and that allows the um, instructor to be able to also communicate and to bridge and to fill in any of those gaps that the students aren't clear on so i think in this the most effective simple strategy is communication in whatever forum works best providing your text your own number if you can um, not everybody wants to do that if you have 400 students but if you only have one class of 20 i found that to be very very helpful i would get texts from the students and usually it was just one who was the leader of the class and then she would um, group chat her friends but it's really important to have that clear communication as the, my colleague said, timely feedback responses and very much um, the expectations and the essential questions. Thank you. I'm curious, I mean, all four of you are experts in teaching online. So what would be one of your favorite tools or a favorite assignment that you absolutely love using when you teach online and you cannot do without? My favorite one, and actually Sharon hinted on this one, is the discussion board. Um, in fact, I love it so much, I use it in face-to-face -face classes now. And precisely for the reasons that Sharon mentioned is it's easy for students, even when you know their names, even when you try to group them and try to go out of your way to make sure you're calling on different students, it's easy for them to, to fall into the woodwork and, and not engage in the course. And the discussion board forces every single student to respond. And it really gives you a great opportunity to see where their learning is happening. So I find the, the discussion board to be invaluable. Again, both online, but I also also use it in face-to-face -face now. My favorite tool is a tool called Flipgrid and um, I find it just wonderful and I use it for all my classes whether I'm teaching online or if I'm teaching um, hybrid courses and it's uh, what's nice about it it's uh, it can be used for everything really for any topic for any discipline you can use it in math, you can use it in languages, you can use it in science, you could use it in writing. Um, the students can um, describe the process, describe how they understood something. They could even just recite a poem, perform something. Um, but what's nice about it is it's very easy to learn. It's very user friendly. And it's just a click on, of a button. They can use it on their, uh, on their phones and you could put uh, the links to it. It's, uh, it's just super easy to use and it allows the use of a whiteboard in addition to just uh, being a regular video platform. 
And I also like voice thread a lot. I'll jump in here again. Um, thanks, Craig. Uh, very much discussion board. That's my, my favorite forum, but I'm, I'm an Uber communicator. And as a former English teacher, I like to write, I like to talk. Um, and so I feel like that's a really good opportunity to be able to converse with students. As far as an assignment goes, um, is an LRQ, a learning ref reflection quote. And anybody in any discipline can do this, even in chemistry. Everybody has to read a book. There's some text to go through. And so to, and less is more here. So something I had my students do, and I have very good feedback on this. I just read my SOTIs and they appreciated it. And that is that they would choose a quote, something out of that chapter, and they would respond to it. So it was a very simple way for them to also practice how to um, insert a quotation into text so they would introduce the quote and then they would discuss what it really meant to them and they would apply that to how they would in, in the instance of education uh, what that means for them both as student teachers and what they would do as teachers in the future so learning reflection quotes we called it the LRQs Well, I think choosing one in particular is kind of difficult because it depends on what you want to do in the class, if it's communications, or if it's assignments, so feedback. For example, the one that um, I always use in every class, no matter what, is the Turnitin, and it's available, of course, in Blackboard, embedded in Blackboard, and then you can help um, the students to give feedback. Even if you don't want to do it by writing, uh, Turnitin allows you to do it um, orally feedback. So the students can even hear you if it's in a language class or a terminology that you want to emphasize on. Another thing is um, Go React. It's very good when the students are turning in their presentations because Go React, also embedded in Blackboard, will allow you to give a feedback again um, by writing or inserting even a video or orally to your students. And another one that I always use is Camtasia. And I know Liz has been doing an amazing training about Camtasia. And if you have not missed them, you can uh, go back and to check the archives of all the amazing um, trainings that ATI has been doing so far. So again, it's very difficult to pick out one in particular because it depends what you are one um, to create the assignment or what you are looking in your classroom. Thank you. I see that we also have a question from the audience, but um, like I said in the beginning, we will wait with the questions until our discussion is over. So I'm curious, um, all four of you have been assisting faculty uh, during this transition. Where, where have you seen the biggest challenges? I think the less is more um, is an important lesson going forward. Um, you know, let's be honest, to design a well set up online experience, if you haven't done it before, takes about a year and you just don't have that kind of time. So picking one or two tools to deliver your information, um, whether that's VoiceThread, Zoom, or a combination, and one or two assessment tools, um, you know, whether you're using you know, quizzes, whether you're using discussion boards, but keep it simple. You know, a couple of ways to deliver your content, a couple of ways to assess student learning, and just work with those. And just don't, you don't need to get ahead of yourself um, given all the, the other constraints and, and workload that's, that's happening right now. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, what Greg said. And um, I also, I mean, I've always known that we have a wonderful dedicated faculty, but now it's just uh, have been highlighted so much more. I see the faculty that I interact with and in general, um, they're just, uh, they really want to do their best and because they're experts in their fields and in what they're doing. And <clears throat> excuse me, they've been um, providing wonderful rich learning experiences in the classrooms and they want to just provide the same learning experience, the same rich experiences for the students. And so I, I found that um, many of our faculty, including myself, I'm, I'm guilty of that. We're perfectionists. We just want to do it where it's perfect. And sometimes it just takes a toll on us. And there is now increased emo emotional labor for, for all of us from administration, staff, faculty, and students. And I think it's a time to just relax a little bit and, and, and just look back and decide that 
no, I don't have to make it perfect. Let me just make it good enough. If it's good enough and it's working, it's meeting students' needs, I do not have to make it perfect. I think that's our biggest challenge is just sit back. You don't have to stay up all night just fixing something, um, you know, on a recording or on a slideshow. It's just really you don't have to. It's more important. Your well-being is more important for, for the students and for everything that we're doing in general. Um, I very much concur with Dr. Mango, Dr. Seal, and I know we all feel this way. In the course of the consults with the teachers, and of course, the emergency and urgency of being thrust into the situation. And these are many of teachers who, at Johnson, guest lecturers, who've taught for 17 years in their content area in a face-to-face -face instruction, and all of a sudden are being asked to pare that down, the things that they would do, their favorites. Everybody has a, a favorite dynamic and something that they do in the classroom. And all of a sudden, that's not being honored. And it's kind of like cutting off a limb. Which one are you going to cut off? And that's difficult. So I think to, you know, again, recognize that this is an opportunity. Um, in working with the instructors, I've seen that they found that. I'm just going to get rid of this. Not the baby with the bathwater, but I'm going to pare it down to what is the most essential. And again, that's part of forgiving. But I think to answer your question directly, Dr. Popescu, it's, it's absolutely the emotion, emotional component here. I think it was the dire circumstances people are dealing with. One of the biggest challenges is the balance between the families that everybody has themselves, their students, and this intense amount of um, responsibility to the students to deal still disseminate the curriculum. These are very, very ethical individuals. The people who I've worked with want to do the best that they can, but there's a sense of um, having to just, again, I'll go back to forgiving ourselves, each other. The third time is the charm in anything. I hope we never have to face this a third time, but we may. And with that, we will be prepared a little bit more each time. Well, in this context, then, what advice or message of hope would you uh, give our faculty as they come to grips with these difficult times? Well, I will start telling everyone that it is impossible that uh, you are going to become, like, a suddenly you are going to become an expert in online teaching and learning all these or everything that. Um, takes to teach an online class in this period of emergency. I don't think it's really worth it. I think my best advice for you is to recognize that you are doing the best that you can and kind of relax and make sure that the students are getting the best of the material and the best of the class that you are preparing for them uh, during this crisis. So to me, it's like, Take a big breath, relax, and the most important is that you know that you are not alone, you are not by yourself. Uh, we are here to help you, ATI, the librarian, even the colleagues, everyone is here. So the most important is that we need to survive this crisis and, and that you acknowledge that you are not by yourself, you are not going through this uh, all by yourself. I will say that the... Well, the, the forays I've had into online um, and hybrid learning have made me a better instructor. Um, and so taking this as a learning opportunity, um, an experience that, that whether you decide to continue in online or you want to go back to face to face, um, I think you will be well served as a faculty member, regardless, just by having this experience of having to learn how to do some of this online. I absolutely agree. Having taught face to face, online, blended, the various ways in which we deliver curriculum. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for people to really hone their craft. The best advice I could give is to have energy prior to going on the screen. We're not actors, people are teachers, but at the same time, you wanna be able to convey as much as possible. If you're gonna go live, if you're gonna have something recorded, whether you're using Flipgrid or whatever you're doing, to have some sort of energy going in. And so that just means a balance. This is an emotionally stressful time. I know sometimes I just have to get up and do five jumping jacks before I'm going to, you know, be in front of students or be in front of my staff. And so there's an emotional kind of component to that. So my best advice would be to um, look at it as an opportunity, 
you're only going to get better and to balance that with all the life things that keep you energized and healthy and happy. Thank you, Dr. Mango. Do you have an advice for the audience? Yes, if I may, I just wanted to add that, um, just like uh, my colleague Bibiana said, um, we, we, you know, you are not in this alone. Um, every one of us is, is learning from this experience. And I am just in awe of the expertise um, that is, you know, in front of us in the university, how everybody has stepped up to help. Um, I have made use of the recordings that were, uh, you know, provided by ATI, and I'm really thankful for every single person there. And, um, you know, it's just, you can, whatever you need, it's just very easy to ask. And I would suggest that you do. Don't try to do everything by yourself because somebody has already done that or has an idea. And it might take them just five minutes to give feedback. Whereas it might take me two, three hours to figure out something that, I'm, that I haven't tried before, but they might give me like a quick hint that will help me do it just in, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you all for your wisdom. And I see some very interesting questions from the audience. So if it's okay with you, I would like to open up the floor to these questions. Is there anything else that we haven't covered before we move into uh, the Q&A portion? No? Okay. So in that case, um, Dr. Mango, um, there is a question from for you. Uh, you mentioned Flipgrid. And and somebody would like to know uh, what that tool is and what does it do exactly? Uh, you can hear me now, right? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Flipgrid is just this uh, wonderful tool. It's like a video platform, but it's much more than that. Because often we want to connect with our students. We want to know how they're thinking. So it can be really used in um, multiple ways, but basically it's just an online video platform, but it's like an app. So our students are used to using uh, different kinds of apps uh, that are um, like social media apps, and it just follows the same kind of thing, uh, but is, you know, targeted towards education. So it's really very easy, very straightforward. All you have to do is put a prompt for students. Students use the link, the, they join the class through the link that you gave them, they respond to that prompt using a video. Uh, however, there are different ways that you could do it. They can use it by um, pointing to something, by displaying something, or by giving a video themselves. I personally have used it where students have given the video themselves. They would share something that they learned, or they would, um, uh, you know, I would give something, because I teach languages, I would give a prompt uh, asking them, uh, for example, um, uh, how would you, uh, what would you say in a certain situation? And then they just go and then just record it. They can also respond to each other. I can also respond to them. I can also model the activity. And it can also be used as an exit ticket because often we want to know how our students are doing and what the class was like for them. So they can go on Flipgrid, just do something really fast. It's just a very quick and easy way to record a video. Through, your, through their phones, through their personal devices. I hope I answered your question, but if you have something specific, I'm also, um, you know, I'm, I'm ready to answer it. But they have the wonderful, um, you know, support. Uh, you know, the company, it just has wonderful support. And, uh, you know, I sometimes send them questions and I get the answers within hours, if, uh, if not sooner. And there's plenty of resources online and it's very user-friendly, very easy to start it as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Mango. I see some incredibly interesting questions from the audience, and um, I am hoping that we will be able to cover all of them in the 20 minutes we have left. So let me start with the easier one. I don't know if it's easier, but the shorter one, and then go to the more complex ones. So um, um, a person from the audience is asking um, about the challenges that uh, people from natural sciences have encountered. That's because um, we don't have any representative of the College of Natural Sciences among us. I have to say that we did send invitations to representatives from all colleges. However, everybody's really busy, so we wanted to respect people's time and we um, 
only the panelists you see in front of you were able to make time for this. Uh, so um, if you know, what are some of the challenges that faculty from CNS have encountered? You know, it's, it's outside my discipline, but I know some of the conversations and I've worked with a couple of the faculty in CNS um, labs is probably the biggest issue, <laughs> um, which is, you know, really difficult, if not impossible to replicate. Um, and then for some of the, the, the groups like math, um, being able to teach in a manner using the technology that they're used to and you don't have blackboards and whiteboards, there is some technology that can allow you to do that. Um, but the equations um, and tracking the equations, I know has been a challenge. I think they've come up with some solutions, but um, it's a little harder lift, I think, quite frankly, for them than it is, say, in my field. I would, I would add to that the fact that um, a lot of the instruction in math is based on live conversation between um, professors and students, uh, which is not very easy to implement, particularly when not all students have access to the technology that would enable them to do that. Additionally, some of the conversations I, uh, I encountered had to do with how do you ensure that students are not teaching, uh, cheating, especially outside Blackboard, because some, um, some math instruction is done outside Blackboard. So some are, these are some of the things that we've encountered. Um, some solutions that we found, um, again, I'm not saying that they are the best possible solutions, but they are more creative than um, what is to be expected, uh, was the use of augmented reality to do 3D scanning of various lab artifacts, for example, rocks for a, a course in geology, and to have students actually examine those rocks with, uh, by means of mobile devices that allow them to look at, um, at the artifacts from all possible angles. But this is something that we are working on, but it's by no means ready. Would anybody else want to comment on that particular challenge? I'll, I'll go ahead and comment on that. I've been doing quite a bit of reading and I think this would work also with the natural sciences and I do have some colleagues uh, who work in sciences at the secondary level and that is the idea of agency and providing the students with the, their own thinking outside the box so within the structure of the content in the class and certainly the standards with which they must um, adhere to what must be learned for lack of a better way to say it the allowing the students to dig deep and to delve into how they are going to demonstrate their learning um, provides them a little bit of responsibility, autonomy, and agency. And at the same time, they're crafting together, they can do collaborative work. Um, and so I would imagine in the sciences, this is something that could possibly work. They're certainly gonna be the straightforward memorization and the content that has to be mastered. There's no equivocating that. But again, to allow the students to create and come up with some of their deep um, learning on their own. And so then they can make presentations to one another. This might be a, a possibility. Not saying it's the be all end all, but it could be a possibility. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have anything else to add? Or are we ready to move to the next question? Okay. So our next question has to do with um, oral communication classes. How do you engage students in an active speech class? If, um, in my opinion, I mean, I've been using in my language classes, I mean, there is that asynchronous part and then there is the synchronous part. If it's asynchronously, then you can just use um, tools like I think Flipgrid is a great tool for that. But uh, if you want something uh, synchronously, then I'm thinking something like Zoom. I mean, I know it's not perfect, but I think it could work. I don't. I hope that helps. Yes, I concur with Orai. Um, nowadays that we are doing more synchronous teaching, the Zoom is a very good um, element to put in your class. It's especially because you can break, break them down into um, you know, teams and they can work and then you can visit each of the groups and then give feedback to each of the groups. So yes, you can, through soon you can really encourage them to talk. Any activity that you can do face-to-face, -face, 
If you are doing synchronous teaching, you can also apply it in a Zoom conference or in this kind of environment that we are creating right now. I do know our communication faculty have been using GoReact. Um, they've been using it prior, and that's one of the tools that interfaces well with Blackboard that really helps them on communication and being able to demonstrate um, communication skills and react to those, those skills. Um, Dr. Seal, would you, uh, can you tell us more about GoReact for um, the people in the audience who have never encountered this tool before? Well, I'm not an expert, um, <laughs> but our communication faculty may, um, and including those who teach our communication course in management. But basically, it allows you to upload um, and, and review and then comment on videos. Um, and these can be done individual. They can also be done in groups. And so it allows you to sort of recreate the, the group presentation and the individual presentation that you might have in a face-to-face -face class. Um, and it allows you to have a little more control than, say, opening up Zoom um, and sort of transferring the mic, so to speak, in a Zoom environment. Um, um, and it allows you to get to comment on those potentially grade um, or provide feedback on it. Thank you. Um, I could add something to that. I'm sorry, Dr. Mango, would you no, like to say okay. something? Um, I just wanted to add that uh, VoiceThread might be a great tool for that as well. I've used VoiceThread in my classes and uh, it's wonderful for, for speaking and for communication because students, um, they can all uh, one person can do a presentation, everybody can just pitch in and give their ideas, give feedback, or even go back and forth, although it's going to be asynchronously. Thanks. So uh, let me add something to both um, the discussion about GoReact and the discussion about VoiceThread. So typically in a class that a face-to-face -face class that involves um, live presentations, um, the student would present and the instructor would take notes and assess the presentation in real time. Now, how do we do that asynchronously? One way to do that would be to ask students to record themselves, which is what GoReact allows them to do, and then to upload those presentations so that the instructor could give them feedback that is time-stamped, that is feedback on particular moments in the presentation where the student did something well or um, needs some improvement. So what GoReact allows you to do is to actually insert those comments at a particular time when you see the student doing something that you want to comment on. And additionally, you have um, pre-programmed uh, reactions that um, supposedly cut down on your uh, work time by giving student encouragement as they, you know, at particular moment when, when that happens, or you can actually create your own reactions. For example, if you have a rubric and you want to point out that the student did something that matches the, the grading rubric, you can also pre-program that and insert those particular reactions in the video. And GoReact also synchronizes with the gradebook, which means that all those reactions will be captured uh, in the Blackboard gradebook. And VoiceThread, of course, is um, another wonderful technology that enables students to interact with the content and with each other by giving them a way to post presentations or audio files or text around um, a, some type of content that you make available on Blackboard. So I hope I, I described that uh, correctly. And yes, GoReact is part of the software offered by CSUSB. It's already integrated on, on Blackboard. And now let us move to the most complex question that we've received from the audience, namely the issue of assessing online, online teaching. So this is a multifaceted question, so I'm going to break it down into several pieces. Um, the first question would be, what are some of the means of assessing online teaching? So we have taught um, or we have assessed online classes before in our department um, and basically we use the same classroom visitation rubric. Um, generally what you would do is permit access to the course um, to whoever is doing the evaluation um, and they would sort of go through the different course um, and kind of look at the different options and, and assess them much as they would do if they were in present. Um, and then of course, um, and so my colleagues can speak to this, but you also can use the cold or quality matters if that's something that um, the faculty and department have, have decided as 
that's a group that they think it's important is another way to look at the design elements of a particular course. So you can do evaluations on an online course. Other reactions? Yes. Um, I was going to say you can actually even do it throughout the course because that allows the instructor to receive uh, their own feedback and then modify and adjust throughout the course so that uh, we're not waiting till the end to receive only that SOT information and that in an online course that's a good opportunity for the university to be able every week every two weeks provide a very quick survey for the students and then give that feedback to the instructor as well so that's a, a possibility. And I think for the, you know, for the instructors, for the professors themselves, when if we want to get this feedback, we want to see how the course is going, then just um, giving one question at the end of a unit or at the end of an activity or um, even after a Zoom session and then just getting this feedback from the students will allow the instructor to just know, okay, what went well, what's going on with the students, what are they learning, how is their learning going, how can I modify, what can I change and make it better next time. I concur with all my colleagues. It's very important, as I emphasized before, the communication. You can just do an exit activity in the classroom. You can even make it fun. You can even do it to a, a kahoot, for example, so everybody can uh, give you feedback to a game. Like you can do it every interactive way that you can find it if you think just a survey is going to be kind of dry in this moment. Um, I would also like to interject something here. The problem is that in face-to-face -face class visitations, uh, senior faculty who have been teaching for a long time uh, sort of understand what's going on and are able to pinpoint if uh, the junior faculty is uh, really mastering the class or is doing something that really works or maybe something that needs improvement. The problem, however, is that we are not all trained on how to evaluate online classes. And this is a, an interesting uh, dilemma to have because in my opinion, having having seen several online classes, it's not particularly obvious uh, what people should be looking for, especially if, let's say, the person doing the visitation has never taught online before, right? So I wonder what solution do we have here or what kind of changes do we need to make in how we actually educate reviewers, uh, particularly now that everybody has the courses um, either online or, you know, on Zoom. So how will these courses be evaluated? And I think that the question from the audience points to this problem that the only mechanism for evaluating these courses right now that we have are the SOTIs, right? So how would we address that? If I can speak to in online, the number one feedback that I've received, and, and fortunately it's been very positive, is that students want constant communication which is why online teaching takes so much time. It takes more time than doing that face-to-face. -face. And it, every single night, every single, and again, there's that balance and having to, to respond, but there's that constant dialogue. So the best um, assessment tool is at the end asking or throughout the course uh, to the students, are you feeling heard? Is your voice being heard? What are ways that, that, because sometimes the professor doesn't even know that perhaps they're not um, conveying something clearly. So it's up to the student and to have, like, like uh, Dr. Diaz said, some question or one pointed question to be able to respond to because there has to be that dialogue going back and forth. Are we being heard? Um, and it, is the communication there? Um, I think for the, when the evaluator will come to your classroom, an online classroom, I think the most important thing is granted access to the data evaluator to your online classroom. So all your online class and in Blackboard, you will have all your design of your class, you will have your objectives, your outcomes. So I know that many people, this is, you know, it's very stressful right now because they are, I don't know anything about online design. I just put all the content in the Blackboard with a link that says contact to the class or whatever or something like that. But I think this as, as we um, 
emphasized before is an emergency time. So I know the evaluators also will take that into consideration. Usually the online evaluator will check or your design if the out, um, outcomes are really clear as uh, Dr. Seol stated before, usually the evaluators online has some experience in online teaching, otherwise they are no need to go to your class and evaluate an online class if they don't have any prior experience to do that. So the most important is have clear contact delivered in Blackboard and also like the objectives and the outcomes very clear. So not only the evaluator, but of course the students will have all the information available. I do want to step back for a moment on this because um, just to clarify, um, I, I'm on the Department Evaluation Committee um, and just so faculty can understand, um, we are not doing classroom visitations this term um, and we are not evaluating courses this term. Um, and so, and when we get to some sort of semblance of normal, um, it would be a collaboration with faculty. The, you know, the ones that we've done online evaluations have been at the behest of faculty saying, can you please take a look at my online course? Um, so again, this isn't going to be forced on faculty they're not going to have to be teaching online. Those courses are not necessarily going to have classroom visitations, so to speak. Um, it's going to be guided by faculty in collaboration with their departments going forward. Thank you. We have a comment from the audience. Um, I wonder if you are familiar with Cornerstone LMS. Um, so Dr. Oh. White says that this is an example of online learning and assessment that is used by the US Census and by Red Cross. So if anybody knows about this, um, I, uh, it would be nice to hear more about uh, this particular tool. If not, we will just uh, note it and uh, research it later. Um, another question uh, has to do, and again, it's part of the more complex comment that I announced a few minutes ago, um, has to do with how faculty could actually create great engagement with the students, in addition to maybe uh, communicating with them or using surveys, because without this sense of presence and engagement, um, this commentator from the audience, um, points out that a lot of the understanding of the subject of the course matter could be lost. Um, so I wonder what you see some of the techniques of creating instructor presence in, uh, in remote instruction. I think um, having the presence of the instructor in terms of um, hearing them, seeing the instructor and hearing them, whether it's through, um, you know, connection through Zoom, or even um, through if you're doing a recording, at least, you know, uh, if you could um, have a recording that shows you as well as you are talking with the students. Um, I, I, I noticed that when I put an assignment for students and I leave my voice, a voice recording with it, then um, they react with it and uh, they're, they're more engaged with the material than if I leave something that's just um, a text or, um, you know, a slide that does not have you know, an audio recording or a video attached to it. I think um, exactly. If you're going to have some sort of um, a face-to-face, -face, whether it's through Zoom or it's a recording, to again, have as much dynamicism as possible. But I think the number one way to develop your presence is to immediately respond to the student's needs. So there's a lot of anxious um, individuals. We are anxious ourselves and they're reaching out in various ways through text, through email, and to you know have, have certainly some boundaries, but to be able to respond really conveys that you care and very much in the way in which the announcements are crafted, um, the way that we're speaking in our email communication, always from the point of um, how are you, I trust everything's well, I want to respond to. So it's just that kind of almost a template for yourself of approaching whatever communication with the student from the idea of care first, and then the communication and that presence develops itself. Um, I would add to that also the fact that the time to response matters more in online environments than in face-to-face -face instruction. Um, the sense of time is different in online instruction. Students expect um, an answer um, that's much faster 
then it would be if they would have the benefit of seeing faculty several times a week. So this is something to keep in mind that sometimes taking several days to answer might not be particularly helpful to the student who is struggling right that moment with a particular issue. Um, we have one minute left. So um, I would like to just add a comment again from the audience that the CSU quality learning and teaching instrument and the quality matters rubric, um, these are things that we've been promoting uh, via the quality assurance program. Also provide criteria for evaluating the soundness of a course design and the soundness of course facilitation. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, we warmly invite you to contact ATI so we can give you more information. And with that, I would like to thank all the panelists for their wisdom and for their grace under fire and for their very interesting comments and uh, uh, to invite you again to contact us and to not lose hope in these difficult times and to use this as an opportunity to reflect on how we can make the learning of our students better. Thank you very much again. I will now give it back, the floor back to James Trotter.